Good to have you all come out this afternoon. We'll try to make it worth your while. Let's start. Let's go to um, Genesis chapter 2 to get our, sort of our bearings. We're doing a study on the book of Genesis, believing what we read. There's nothing wrong with that. I've said it many times, if we can't believe what God's Word says about the past, how can we believe what God's Word says about the future? If God got this wrong, the future is based on this. If this is wrong, what does that say about our future? Where we're headed, where we want to go. I don't want to stay down here any longer than I have to. It's a mess. It's a messed up world. It's full of wicked, evil, pain and suffering and sorrow and loss. And I want the next place. I want it, I want it better than this one. And so if the Bible's wrong about the past, we don't have a future to hold on to. And I want a future. Revelation 20 is what I, we're going to go to, but I want to read Genesis 2. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended His work, which He had made. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day. And we're learning a lot of things here, remember. We're learning about the typology of the creation, what it, what it symbolizes... We're learning about how God uses numbers because God clearly had an order to each and every day. He didn't just make it up as he went. He had planned this. So each and every day represents something about God. The seventh day, that number seven is a number for perfection and completion and sanctification. And here you see that in this text. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Sanctification comes from God's Spirit and the blood of Christ. There are seven spirits of God. Mentioned in uh, Isaiah 11, you see it in the seven candlesticks in Revelation chapter 4 and, and in the tabernacle. And because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So we believe what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. So what God has done, he's established then a plan for, for the ages. He's established a definite time period for his work on this earth, our labor on this earth. And there's coming a day of rest. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And uh, something I wanted, to, I wanted to get to in the message this morning, I didn't, so I'll have to think about how I'm going to say it next Sunday morning. But what I, what I like about having chains and knowing Jesus is that the chains that the devil put on me, I hope to be able to lay on him and bind him. Amen? Amen? When the devil comes after us, causes pain, misery, trouble, damage, I'm looking forward to the day where we can do that to him. Amen? Our, my enemies are not flesh and blood, they're spirits, they're evil spirits. I hate them, I hate every one of them. I hate what they do. So, verse 2, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I believe that. So I believe a thousand years, no devils anywhere. Amen. I hear the man upstairs shouting amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask God that you guide us in this lesson and fill our hearts with hope instead of fear. Father, there's a lot of things in this world I'm not looking forward to. But Lord, walking with you just makes it better. 
And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would lighten our eyes and fill us with knowledge and understanding and help us to see, Lord, a better day that's coming to this world. You have a rest plan for this world, and this world's going to rest. And it's going to be exactly the way your word said it would be, a thousand years. So, Father, fill our hearts and our minds with that. We long for your kingdom here on this earth. We ask your blessings on your word. We love you and help us, Father, with our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. So that thousand years, do you believe that's a literal thousand years? I do. I'm not even going to give you a chance to say no. I do. If he said a thousand years, it means a thousand years. If he says three days, he means three days. If he says a day, he means a day. Or he could mean a thousand years because... 2 Peter 3, 8, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Then a double witness to that, out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. Psalm 90, verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. And if you look at that in the sort of the spiritual realm, the metaphorical realm, I mean, you understand sort of the idea that with God, time is nothing. A thousand years pass, well, that's like a day for God. That's no big deal. So you can understand it that way, but you can take it in its literal fashion. You have two witnesses that are declaring to you a day as a thousand years, or a thousand years is as a day. So I'll give you a phrase out of the Bible. The day of the Lord. And think about what that means. I, number one, I literally believe that it means a specific day, 24 hours, when Christ is going to come down and it's not going to be good for everybody that's disobeyed God. Okay? But then I also believe that it is the day of the Lord, a thousand years of Christ himself being the president of the world. The president of all presidents, the king of all kings, and the lord of all lords. You know, in, in Great Britain, they still refer to men as lord. A judge, you, refer, you don't say your honor, you say my lord. They still have a monarch in England, a queen. Soon it's going to be a king. But Christ is going to come down and he's going to be in charge of everybody. No political corruption, no bribes, no kickbacks, no tweets, amen, no tweets, <laughs> amen, looking forward to it. So, there on the screen, here's what I believe the Bible's laying out for us, from the creation to somewhere close to now. A period of six days. We look at the lineages of the Bible, take them as they're given to us in scriptures. We have a, we have a clock, a calendar at, as such. In the Bible, we can, it's been calculated the, the, the number of years that each man lived, where, what man he came from, how old that man was, and then we go back to his father, how old he was, and go back to his father, how old he was. So we know we follow the lineage of the Bible back about 6,000 years. Six days. But then Christ is going to return. And for 1,000 years, that's what I have up there on the screen, the Sabbath. The thousand year reign. And then after that, the new creation. Where John says, I see a new heaven and a new earth for the old earth and old heaven are passed away and there's no more sea. So that's the eighth day. Eight And even the number eight, it's a new beginning. It even looks that way. Where it starts and stops, it starts all over again. Okay? And so that's the meaning of the number eight, a new start, a new beginning. Isaac was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, physiologically, we're told that a baby's immune system is at its peak beginning on the eighth day. So medically, it makes sense to circumcise on that day. That way they don't get an infection and die from it. They're, they're small babies. They're very, you know, they're unprotected. 
So on the eighth day, physiologically, it makes sense. But then the symbolism of that is he's casting off the old, the flesh, and revealing the new. And that's what that's all about. It's what salvation's all about. It's casting off this filthy, nasty flesh that never honors God. And that new man coming forth out of us is what that means. Turn to Isaiah 11. Let's look at some of the things that the Bible says is going to happen during that 1,000 year reign. And you have to understand now, during this time, we have the total absence of any deceiving spirit and rebellious spirit and familiar spirit and devils and they're all gone. Satan himself is bound for a thousand years and gagged, hopefully. But he's tied up. He's in a bottomless pit. He's in the quantum realm. He doesn't exist, but he does exist. So he's down in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So there's no deceiver, no tempter, no liar, no spirit that prompts you to go and kill a bunch of people in a store or a mall or a theater. I believe all those had spirits related to it. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. So all of that's over with. So, and this is where we bring in the idea they're going to take their swords. They won't need them. For a thousand years, nobody's going to need a sword. They're going to take their swords and beat them into plowshares. They're going to take all those weapons of war, convert them into feeding hungry people instead of killing people. Wow. So Isaiah 11, verse 4, With righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Now, why the meek of the earth? The meek of the earth have inherited the earth. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. So that's who's here. God has reserved the best of the best to dwell in this earth during this time. So he has the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So get this in your mind. Anybody who gets out of line, capital punishment administered by the righteous judge, Jesus Christ himself. He's the creator, so he has the right to judge with capital punishment those who defile his commandments. Now, Christ is going to be the head. All of his saints that have come back with him, which I believe would be us, we're going to be in different bodies. We're going to be in our new man bodies. That body doesn't get hungry and it doesn't get thirsty and it doesn't need air and it doesn't need warm clothes and it doesn't need expensive jewelry and it doesn't need money of any kind whatsoever. So can you bribe one of those judges? See, he's going to bring us down to rule and reign with him. That's what he said twice. Rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. So... I hope I get Alaska, sweetie pie. I'll be perfect. I'll enjoy it. Okay? But we'll rule and reign with Christ. We'll help him. Just, and the, there's a model of that. When Moses was the head judge there of the Israelites, he had every trifling matter coming before him. Uh, yes, Moses, uh, we've been waiting five hours to, for you to judge us, but they're going got in our fence and tore up our fence. And Moses has to hear that little dispute between two people. So his father Jethro came to him and said, Moses, it's not wise what you're doing. Why don't you appoint men and let God put his spirit on them and they will help you judge. So that's exactly what happened. And there was, it was like the, the number 10 was all in that because there was Judges over thousands, judges over hundreds, judges over fifties, and judges over tens. So they all had a little court system where each and every individual judge would rule over a certain section or a certain area. 
And that allowed Moses to be free to be the head judge. They, they, and all the appeals came up to him, just like what we have in our court system now. And that's what's going to be present on this earth. But every judge that's going to rule over the earth with Christ is going to be as perfect as Christ and will not be able to take bribes. We won't need them. What are you, what are you going to do? Offer me gold? I just came from a place where there, that's pavement. And our gold, if I wanted gold, I'd go up there and get it. It's free for me. I have all the gold I want. You can't bribe me. So they're going to rule in righteousness. Not be, you know, some floozy woman wanting to influence the judge her way. We won't do that. We'll have glorified new bodies that will not, we'll be going, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you just don't do it for me. I'm a spirit. Amen. So, I mean, that, that's how it's going to be. All right, now verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So he's going to rule in righteousness and faithfulness. Faithfulness to God's law. Look at verse 6. God's going to change the nature of nature. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, not the lion. That was never in the Bible. <laughs> not Somebody didn't go back in time, Todd, and change Isaiah 40 or Isaiah 11, verse 6, and make it say lie. Nobody did that. But that's the stupid conspiracy theory that's out there. Okay? But I want you to get past that and think about what he's going to do here. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Wait a minute. Wolves eat lambs. Not anymore. Not during Christ's reign. Jesus is going to change the nature. If you noticed, before the flood, God gave man every herb for his meat. Man ate the impossible whopper, whopper during that time. He had a vegetarian diet, period. Everything did. It wasn't until after man sinned. Then, after the flood, God said, I've given you every beast of the field for your meat. Now we're eating flesh. But before that, we were eating vegetation. And apparently, it's going to be, re it's going to be returned back to that. So even the wolf will be amongst the sheep, but he'll be harmless because his nature is going to be changed. And he will not be a threat to your children, Courtney. You'll not have to shoot any rabid dogs. Nothing. Their nature is going to be changed. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Talking about maybe a goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So you'll be able to turn Liam loose with his pet lion and his pet wolf and his pet alligator, his pet snake, and all of his pet lambs, and he'll be able to go out and play with all of them. And you won't be in fear that he's going to be eaten by one of those. Won't that be neat? And it's like, you know, after the flood, God put a fear of man in all the animals. And so maybe God may remove that fear. And we'll be, have birds landing on our fingers. That's fine. Just don't poop on my car anymore. Amen. Okay. At verse seven, and the cow and the bear shall, shall feed the cow and the bear and their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Look at that. I mean, I, I, there's a YouTube channel. I watch a guy Rob the ranger from South Africa or somewhere around in there. And he leads people on these little safaris. He's got a couple of dens of lions that he takes people to. And I've watched them. They'll kill one of these big musk oxes. Or whenever they kill an antelope or something like that. They'll eat the intestines. But they squeeze out the uh, vegetation that they ate. Because they don't eat that. They don't like it. They'll eat the gut. But they'll squeeze out the contents of it. And not eat that. They don't eat that. That's for the vultures. And the, and the worms and all that stuff. But what God's going to do is God's going to change their nature and wolves are going to eat grass 
and graves and pastures. Can you imagine that? And I think if you take this idea and then spread it out all over there, I think what God's doing is he's making what used to be harmful, he's making it harmless. The sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp. That's a, that's a venomous serpent. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy it. All my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everybody is going to know Jesus. Everybody is going to be right with God. Everybody is going to be harmless. Every animal and every person is going to be harmless. That's what Christ does when He rules. Say amen to that. Look at verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which is Christ, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. He's going to be the symbol of all the nations. To it shall the Gentiles seek. And his rest, there it is right there, his rest shall be glorious. That nap that you always wanted, you're getting it. You're going to get it. It's going to be the most glorious nap you've ever taken. So when you wake up, somebody says, how was your nap? You'll say, it was glorious. Verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble to the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dis dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Not only does the wolf and the lamb not hate each other anymore, but the nations don't hate each other anymore. No tribal wars, no racial wars, no nation against nation, family against family. Everybody will like everything that's on Facebook. Everything. Huh? Amen. Amen. God's going to, he's going to, Jesus reigns here. Jesus is ruling and reigning and the devil is not stirring up trouble amongst people and tribes and things like that. He's not stirring up nations to cause them to go to war. So verse uh, 14, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west and they shall spoil them with east together and they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab. And the of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. He's going to, for some reason, is going to cut off seven streams so man can cross. And there shall be an highway from the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Remember what I said, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. And God just showed you that. What he showed you is how Israel came across the Red Sea when the waters were parted. How Israel did that is exactly what God's going to do here with these seven rivers. He's going to cut it off so they can cross over from wherever they were to come into the land now that God promised them. He's going to give it to them. By the way, the land that God promised Abraham has, to my knowledge, never been completely ruled over by the nation of Israel. It's never happened. I believe that it's going to be during this time. God's going to give it to him. Okay? Just like he did back when Israel crossed the Red Sea 
So if you don't believe that, then you can't believe this. If that didn't happen, this won't happen. But this happened. So now this is going to happen exactly the way God did it back then. So study your Bible history if you want to know what's going to happen in the future. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40. Beautiful prophecies here. Man, I've got more time than I thought. This might be the one service where I don't have enough scripture to give you. That's going to be bad. You guys might fire me. Look at Isaiah 40. I'm going to have to lengthen this out a little bit. Look at verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Why did God say it twice? It's, going to ha it's important. That's good. But it's going to happen twice. Think Old Testament, New Testament. Christ's first coming, his second coming. First outpouring of the Holy Spirit, second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, part of what was prophesied in Joel took place, but not all of it. The sun was not darkened, the moon did not turn to blood, the stars did not fall. The heavens didn't shake. Those things did not happen. There was not blood and pillars of smoke and there none of that happened when the holy ghost was poured out the first time so does that mean that it's not going to happen that it's all sort of metaphors and god didn't really mean that no i think he really meant what he said but it hasn't happened yet meaning god's going to fulfill it the second time here's jesus now in hebrews 10 and remember what he says he says lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O god so if he's only fulfilled part of the scripture, he must come back then to fulfill the whole of scripture, all of it. So comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Comfort, the word comfort is in the Bible 66 times. Steve, think about that. 66 books, and we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. Amen. So, speak ye, verse 2, speak ye comfort, comfortably, that's easy for me to say, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand what? Double. For all her sins. Comfort ye, comfort ye. What did Elisha want from Elijah? The double portion. Second outpouring is going to be greater than the first one. Whew. Now verse 3, which is what I have on the screen. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. In the first coming, that was John the Baptist. So, we know the scripture says that Elijah is going to come and prepare the way of the Lord. So it seems to me then that the perfect fulfillment of this would truly be Elijah coming. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now look at the, and think about this now. Every valley shall be exalted. Every valley in the world filled up and every mountain and hill shall be made low mount everest mount hood mount st helens mount fuji all of the himalayas all of the rocky mountains all the appalachian mountains if you ever drive through west virginia god's gonna go <clears throat> And the world really will be flat in that day. Okay? The earth. And then look at this. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. Now think about it. How, how hard it is to go from one place to the other. Even, even when you fly in an airplane, does it get bumpy? 
Absolutely. God's going to make it all plain, easy to go back and forth from one place to another. Can you, I can't fathom that. But I believe it. I believe God is going to do exactly that to this world to make it easy from, for you to go from one place to the next. The roads are going to be straight, which means that I'll be able to drive a lot faster on them <laughs> and not worry about that dangerous curve sign that I see coming up. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. This is what I like. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And so I believe that Christ is going to be revealed from heaven. He's going to come down. All the mountains brought down, all the valleys brought up. All of the rough places plain, all the crooked paths are now going to be straight. Everything is going to be perfect now. Absolutely spot on. As perfect as this world can possibly be, Christ is going to make it that way for mankind when he rules over them for a thousand years. Boy, this is a... Turn to Micah chapter 4. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter 4, verse 1. I like this. So I, I believe that it, it looks like there's going to be one mountain area. So it says in the last days, Micah chapter 4, verse 1, In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. So one mountain area which would be the mountain of the Lord. You know, think about, think about in, in earth history, every civilization on earth had a God that they worshipped on a mountain. Every one of them. If there was a mountain, there was a people in the valley who worshipped a God on that mountain. It's in Greek mythology, it's in Roman mythology, it's in Babylonian mythology, in Egyptian mythology. It's every, it's all up and down the North America, South America, and where they didn't have a mountain, they built one. They built a pyramid. They had a high place. If it had to be artificial, it had to be artificial. But they built a high place because that's where they were going to meet their God at or do their sacrifice. So... Even in the book of Daniel, when you have, in, in Daniel chapter 2, when you have the four kingdoms spoken of through the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the legs of brass, the feet of iron and clay. When you have that, what brings all of that kingdom down? It's a stone cut without hands. That's Christ. He is, he is not a stone cut out with man's hands. That would be an idol. He is a stone that was cut out with out man's hands. Man did not make Jesus. So this Jesus comes and he goes for the feet, the ten toes, because that's what causes it to stand. And when he destroys that kingdom, the rest of it crumbles down into dust. That stone then becomes a great mountain. And that's what you see here in Micah chapter 4. It's the mountain of the house of the Lord. And it shall be a in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. They want to come and see Jesus in his house. And many nations, verse 2, shall come and, sh and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You have a picture of that. Ezra, standing up behind a pulpit of wood, and he opens the book, and everybody stood up in reverence and awe of the book. And the Bible says that, that Ezra spent that day reading to them the law of Moses, 
And then he spent time teaching them the law, making it plain and causing them to understand the meaning of the law. And that's what Ezra, the, scribe, the ready scribe of the Lord, did. He's acting out Christ, who then when he comes down and establishes his house, all of the people are going to come to that house. Just like Sunday meeting. When God's people gather to his house, what are you here for? We here just to sing? No. We're here to hear the word of the Lord. So if we come here and we don't hear the word of the Lord, what are we doing here? Because that's what's going to... We're, we're acting it out right now, Ron. We're acting out the prophecy by coming into the Lord's house and hearing the word of the Lord. So in verse 3, And he shall judge among many people. And rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Won't that be worth it? Every war that we fought... The blood that has been spilled in war. I hate war. I hate war. It's bad. It's an, it's an evil thing to have to go to war. Because we're sending men out to represent our nation to kill other people who get in our way. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there's a just and righteous war to, to wage. Don't get me wrong. But war in itself is not something that we should be seeking after. It always leaves victims. But in this case, Christ, because he's reigning, he has eliminated war. This nation is never going to fight against this nation. The, the animals themselves, we've already seen that, where they're all going to become tame. They're not going to long for blood or meat. They're going to eat grass like an ox. They're going to be vegetarians. Every animal, every species. And then I believe probably people. So look what they're doing. They're taking their weapons of war. Turning them into farming implements. So they can grow. We, we just came from Iowa yesterday. And all we saw was corn here, soybeans here. And Sterling and I are talking about that and we're agreeing. Boy, it just it's a waste to let if this land to just sit here. This good land that they've that good flat ground that they got up there, it'd be a waste for them to do anything else with it. Let's feed somebody with that land. Amen. Okay, well that's what's gonna happen here. Instead of spending I mean, think about our budget in this nation, how much is spent on defense? Is it billions? Billions of dollars to defend our nation? Righteously so, but billions of dollars spent. And now, during the reign of Christ, all of that effort and all of those resources are no longer going in to kill people. They're going in to feed people. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of prince that Christ is. There's going to be peace on this earth. And rest. So verse, um, uh, verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. No police officers, Cubby. No cops. Not necessary. A man sitting under his fig tree. Pulling figs down, eating them. A man walks by. Sir, would you like a fig? Sure. Shares his figs. Shares his vine with him. It's going to be that kind of world. Man, I look forward to that. For all people will walk, verse 5, for all people will walk, everyone, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out. And her that I have afflicted. And will make her that halted a remnant. And her that was cast 
far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. God's going to take those who have been destroyed, those who have been ravaged. He's going to make strong nations out of them. Um, do this. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So that's, that's essentially, and there's more there in the scriptures concerning the Lord's reign and the day of the Lord and how Christ is going to do things. But I think it's safe to say that number one, there will be no danger from any creature and possibly even viruses and diseases. No viruses, no infection, no danger from any animal of any kind, no warfare, none. So man, instead of working to defend, he now labors to benefit others because the golden rule is going to be in place love your neighbor even as yourself because that's Christ's laws isn't it? he's only got two love the Lord your God love your neighbor as yourself he's only got two laws surely that's going to be easy to follow so everybody is going to love their neighbor and Satan who desperately wants to get back up there and foul it all up can't He's falling farther and farther and farther away. And then, so there's no more war. So there's no more police. No need for police. No need for video surveillance. No need for the CIA, the NSA, defense intelligence agencies. No need for the Pentagon. No need for large factories spewing out smoke. No need for anything that would... There's no need for prisons. Because this man loves his neighbor and he's not going to do anything to his neighbor. S study the law of Moses. In the law that God gave to Moses for the Israelites, do you see any jails in that law as punishment for offenses? You see any prison or any jails or any clause for that at all. I never realized that. And I heard Reg Kelly preach it one time and I'm going, you know what? He's right. Whenever there was judgment, there was an instant punishment or an instant rendering of whatever sentence was out. It was over. You either got lashes or you had to restore something, maybe multiplied that or you were killed. But there was no jails and no prisons, no re reform centers. It was just the judgment of God and then it was over with. That was it. So I think that's going to be applied during that 1,000 years. No penitentiaries, no reform schools. When the judges make their decision, it's an instantaneous judgment and the sentence is automatically carried out. And then it's over with. It's done. No police enforcement. Nothing is necessary. So you're going to eliminate most government bureaucracies. Most of them are going to be eliminated. Amen. No taxes. No taxes. No, but there will be free will offerings. People will bring offerings unto the Lord. I believe that. Okay. They'll do it out of the free will. They'll do it because they love the Lord. And maybe God's given them so much that there's some people that aren't doing so well. And so that can be given to them. And nobody cares that it's given to them. There's no strings attached to that. We're actually dealing with the most perfect. It's what... The United Nations was formed for this, but the United Nations will never be able to carry this out. Never be able to. It's too much evil and too much greed. Too many devils in that group. Amen? 
But in the case of Christ, it's going to be his perfect Eden. He's going to restore how it was in the Garden of Eden, I believe. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had caused it to rain upon their... Oh, excuse me, I got to read that differently. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain. That is a bad misstatement. Had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. So Adam did not farm. He did not need to. Every herb, every fruit yielding tree, every herb yielding tree yielded automatically and was constantly fed with, the, here's what the Bible says, there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So the rain didn't come down. It misted up from the surface. So every field, every tree was constantly watered. So when you bit into that peach, water just shot down all over your body. So think about Adam naked, eating a peach. And peach juice just running all down his body. All right? Okay, stop thinking that. But that's, that's how it was. Now this is a setup for the flood. So we believe that all this moisture in the atmosphere, tons of water's heavy. Below the surface of the earth and above. So there, the idea is a vapor canopy over the earth. Adam and his progeny living into the 900 year range, probably because Harmful rays from the sun being filtered out by that vapor canopy. So his cells are not being destroyed nearly as quickly as they are to us right now. Because that vapor canopy then collapses on the earth for 40. It takes 40 days to get rid of all that rain. That's a lot of rain. If it rains for five days here, it's a mess everywhere. Think of it raining 40 solid days without letting up. So this is the setup for the flood. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, um, I, I got some things I want to say about that, but I, I, can't, I don't have time to get into it. But I am going to say something, and it's probably going to hurt somebody's feelings. Name for me any other creature that God made where he breathed into that creature's nostrils his own breath of life for that creature to become a living soul. Was there any other creature that God did that to? No. And our soul, and this is the difference between us and animals and trees. Don't talk to trees. Don't talk to trees. They're not listening. And they're not hearing you. And they're not benefiting by you talking to them. Don't do that. Don't hug them. Animals. Animals cannot perceive their own existence. You understand that? Man has a living soul. Man is unique above all the creation. From all the primates, they call them primates because it's like a primary form of what they believe man was. The idea of evolution is man came from those monkeys. That's a lie. It's an outright lie. Didn't happen. Never happened. They find a piece of a skull. And out of that, they theorize that that piece of a skull must have come from this particular form of man who looked like this little monkey thing here. And it's not true. 
So no evolution. And God takes man and makes him unique in that God breathes into him his very own breath of life. So man now become man now has the ability to perceive his own existence. There's a phrase, I think, therefore I am. The phrase, I am. We can say that. Animals can't. They do not have the knowledge of their own existence. They operate by genetic traits, by genetic programming, by training, by experience. That's how they think. But animals cannot conceive and be aware of their own existence in this universe. Much less think about God. They can't do it. They don't have the ability to do it. We alone do. Now, I've been asked this several times. And I cannot lie. And I won't lie. People ask me. Is my dog going to heaven? No. No. There are no dogs in heaven. Christ did not die to redeem dogs, cats, horses, pet monkeys, pet birds, Pet gerbils. He did not die to read. They do not sin. They cannot be found in error. God does not hold against them transgressions of the law. Other than if your ox gore your neighbor, then the ox has to be killed and you have to, you're guilty as well. But you understand that Christ's death cross did not save animals. There's nothing in scripture that indicates that our pets die and wait for us in heaven. Nothing in the Bible. Now people say, well, I see animals in heaven. That's right, God made them up there. Jesus come back riding on horses. It's not the horse that died here that lived a good, happy life that got to go to heaven to come back. That's not how happened. God made creatures up there and creatures down here. And they're not the same. So, and when you get to heaven and you see what's there, you won't miss your dog. Amen? Now I know it's going to, I'm dead serious, it's some people angry that I say this, but I have to speak the truth. I do not believe in salvation or redemption for beasts. Only man. Only man. Heavenly Father. Lord, I do thank you for giving us beasts in this earth. It's nice to have a pet. It's nice to have a good dog. It's nice to have animals who we can train and that obey us. And it, it's nice. It gives, gives us pleasure, Lord, to do that. Father, you redeemed us only. Christ died for us only. You breathed into us of your own breath, causing us to have the soul that we have. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would give us comfort, not in that our animals will be in heaven, but that something far greater will be there for us in heaven. So, Father, I pray that you'd bless your word. And we look forward to the coming of your kingdom. We're sick and tired of the politics of this world. We're sick of it. So, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus.
and clean up this mess that we've made. <coughs> Father, we ask your blessings now. Dismiss us in your care and your love, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.